Goedemiddag, alle aanwezigen. We kennen er nog een hele hoop van de At the time, 
I told them, well, we built this land, we do not want any Palestinian on it. So they bought the land and they kicked all the Palestinian workers off the land. And from then on, Palestinians started getting aware of the fact that these, like, let's say, immigrants or Europeans who come to Palestine are not here to actually live with us. They are here to replace us. And there started being like a lot of confrontations between the, uh, the immigrants and, uh, and the Palestinians in Palestine. Just to jump on uh, other, other ways how the World Zionist Organization managed to acquire land in Palestine, uh, it was easy through the British mandate to give public land to the immigrants to work on it and start like uh, European kind of uh, communities, working communities. It's, today it's called kibbutzes, or it used to be called kibbutzes, it's basically like uh, European immigrants will come and get a piece of land from the British mandate and work on it for uh, like like they work on it by themselves without even allowing Palestinians to work along with them. So from 19 let's say 1917 all the way until 1948, uh, uh, Zionist immigrants in Palestine acquired nearly seven percent of of the land. Uh, that was not enough to start a homeland. So what to do? The uh, the British, like in 1947, the British wanted to leave Palestine. They created a huge mess where Palestine was like one third of the population there were like European immigrants, and these European immigrants want a homeland in the, in Palestine. So they went to the UN to solve this dilemma. Uh, the UN proposed a partition plan, uh, just basically cut down the country and give half of it to European immigrants and the other half to the, uh, the local population. And of course that was so celebrated, like, you know, to jump from the fact of having 7% of Palestine to having nearly 52% only with like a decision from the UN. So it was like very much celebrated uh, within the, uh, the Zionist movement as a recognition from the world that now we can start like a the implementation of Jewish homeland. Of course, the issue was rejected because Palestinians viewed that as losing half of their uh, land, half of their country. <coughs> uh, so uh, it was rejected, and after that, like what? Based on the uh, like after the uh, uh, the partition plan was passed, the uh, like the, there there is like the, the war broke out basically between the immigrants and the locals. And uh, between 1948 and 19, between 1947, like after a couple of weeks after the passage of the resolution uh, of the partition of Palestine, uh, war broke out, and that there are like enough Israeli evidence, like even evidence from the, the the Israeli government itself, claimed that there has been a systematic expulsion of Palestinians, and nearly. Uh, 70% of the Palestinian population was expelled outside of Palestine by, uh, like, by the time, like, but even by the time Israel was established in May of 14, two thirds of the Palestinian population was already out outside of Palestine. Thank you. Sorry. No, it's fine. Thanks. So after the war broke down, the state of Israel was established on nearly 78% uh, of Palestine, like over, uh, over that, that period of time, like basically Palestinians lost 78% 78 of, uh, of, uh, of, of their land, let's say. Uh, also what to do, now, now this had led up to the loss of 78% of Palestine. Now, the state of Israel, after becoming a state, knew that it should not behave in a way like it used to behave before 1948, in like a militia type of, of attitude, where they, they, they have to start building a state. They looked at the state and found out that the property, the ownership of property of, of the land, belongs to the masses that were expelled out of Palestine. So what to do in order to just take away that kind of property? They passed a law, one of the very first military laws that the state of Israel passed is called the, the absentee law. Uh, the absentee law is very simple. Like any person who owns property in the state of Israel and does not exist within the borders of the state of Israel, its property will 
be managed by the, the government itself. So overnight, all the Palestinian refugees lost all their property for, for the state. It's like, you know, uh, most of the pa Palestinian population was expelled, but still there was about 120,000 Palestinians who left within the borders of the newly created state. So what to do with these people? They created a law called the, the Present Absentee Law. And it's basically, the law says that, yeah, you are present as a non-Jewish person, you are pre or an Arab citizen of the state, you are present within the borders of the state of Israel, but you have no right to go back to the community where, where you live. Because there was uh, about seven, 60 or 70 percent, I'm not sure about the number, of the Palestinians who remained within the borders of uh, Israel were internally displaced. So we have a lot of villages. Uh, and there are examples about Kufar Bar'a, for instance, one of the Palestinian villages uh, near Nazareth, where the population of Kufar Bar'a were expelled to Nazareth. And after the war calmed down and the state of Israel was uh, established, they wanted to go back to Kufar Bar'a. And the state said, well, no, like you, you can't do that because when the state was formed, you were not in Kufar Bar'a. You know? So they passed something called like the, the present absentee law, and it serves the exact same uh, uh, aim as the, the absentee law. It's like, uh, yeah, we, we know that like you were not on your property at the time of the creation of, uh, of the State of Israel. It's like very awkward law because like there's no such thing as present absentee. You are either present or absent. <laughs> You know, but over that period, like Israel managed to uh, take away like a lot of the land uh, within the boundaries of the state of Israel. A lot of the land of the Palestinians, property of Palestinians, was just overnight lost. The the other way, which has been like practiced by the state uh, ever since like 1948, is uh, the the issue of uh, city planning, like. Uh, since the year 1948, no one new Palestinian community was allowed to be established. Uh, it goes even further than that. Like a lot of the Palestinian communities that were established even before the state of Israel was created could not make it on the community list that was issued by, by the state. Community list, I mean that there were, <coughs> that the, the, the minister of planning decided to find out where they communities uh, in the state are, put them on the list, like cities, villages, like any, any kind of like uh, populated areas, put them on, on a list and say, well, this is the list of the cities in the state. Like nearly half of the Palestinian communities that were remained after, like were remained after the uh, expulsion of the Palestinians in 1948, almost half of them were not became something that the international community refers to as the unrecognized villages. So it is villages, it's communities that existed, but they are not recognized by the state. Not recognized by the state means that they receive no kind of services and any kind of... <laughs> and any kind of infrastructure that was... Uh, uh, that is needed for... Uh, any community like a school or road network or uh, water infrastructure and so on did not make it to any of these uh, Palestinian communities and now we have something happens all the time in within Israel I'm talking about now. like in the south of Israel in the, uh, like in the Negev desert like there are so many Palestinians who have been living in communities and the state of Israel continuously like uh, erase their communities. Uh, it's very interesting to read about the un, the the like the, the issue of the unrecognized villages because you'll find like world records and for instance like how many times a community was destroyed and uh, like there's a community called Truan of Jerwal which was destroyed like 36 times. That means that the people of that community have rebuilt it for 37 times. Of course we say it's a sign of Palestinian resistance and resistance. But if you look at it, like people rebuild their houses for 37 times, but they have nowhere else to go. They have nowhere, no, they have no land uh, elsewhere. So the, the issue of, 
of managing the land within the state of Israel was always in favor of the state and on the expense of the owner of the property, which is in most of the cases the Palestinians. Now to jump from managing land within the state of Israel to managing land in uh, in, in the occupied territory, in the West Bank. Like we know in 1967, uh, Israel completed the occupation of Palestine. Uh, the uh, West Bank and Gaza fell under uh, Israel control as well uh, as the Golan Heights from Syria. Uh, what has been happening in terms of land issues in, uh, in the West Bank falls in the same manner as what is happening in, in Israel. But it has different names because like the West Bank falls under military occupation. Uh, Israel falls under uh, civil control, you know. But it has like different, like have different names, but it serves for the same purpose, which is like control over land, like basically continuing to control the the land of the Palestinians. And that happens. Uh, also, that has been happening through military laws uh, since 1967. The uh, the, the, the first land that has been, and here what I want to talk about is something completely illegal under inter international law. It's called annexation. You know, and uh, like it's illegal for any, it maybe can be tolerated that any state will militarily occupy uh, uh, another uh, land. There is like, that's why the 14th Naval Convention was uh, made in the very beginning, just to give. Uh, rules for military occupation, but when we are talking about annexation, we are talking about something completely illegal, like you can't occupy somebody else's country and then annex it to yours. And Israel annexes land in, uh, in the West Bank in, since the, uh, 1967 by first declaring all the public land, uh, communal land, across the West Bank as uh, state land for the state of Israel. So the, the only public who existed in the West Bank who have right to public property is the state of Israel itself. Uh, I'm talking about like public uh, or communal uh, uh, land that in Palestine, like farmers usually had private property, but also there has been like property for the community itself where it will be passed from one poor family to another poor family to work it. Uh, in order to make income for themselves. So it's not owned by a certain family. It's not private property. It's owned by, uh, by the community at all. That was one of the very first things that we lost. The other thing was like declaring all the land that used to be uh, uh, military camps for the different militaries that controlled Palestine, like the Ottoman, British, Jordanian, uh, take all these spots and place them under Israeli military control and turn them into Israeli military camp. And of course, the Fort Geneva Convention allows uh, temper uh, expropriation of land for security reasons. They, the Israeli military used that to the best because they, in some cases, doubled or trebled the size of, of these military camps on the expense of the private property of the Palestinians who own land around uh, around these camps, and like a lot of these military camps, like turned into uh, settlements in uh, in the West Bank. Like if you read about the names of settlements, and you read the name Nahal, Nahal uh, means that it means something like military or uh, militia. So any settlement in the West Bank that starts with Nahal, it used to be uh, a military camp, but it's no longer serving a military purpose because it's full of civilians now. The uh, other thing is about also the, you know, the planning and construction thing I spoke about that happens in, uh, in Israel. The uh, state of Israel and the Israeli military did the exact same in the West Bank. Like, no one new Palestinian community is allowed to be created. Uh, and they, they just decided what, like, how big a pa an existing Palestinian community can be. And that was it since the year 1967. Like no Palestinian community in the West Bank was allowed to, to expand since 1967. And that's whenever you hear of like house demolition, house demolition, house demolition, it happens because Palestinians try to build on their private property, but outside 
the uh, the plan of the city that used to be in there in 1967. There is something I should talk about because we encounter that a lot in uh, in our jobs, like declaring state land in uh, in the occupied territories, like. Uh, some genius legal advisor for the uh, the Israeli government in the 70s I found out that the British and the Ottoman Empire used to apply uh, a rule uh, in, uh, and they passed that rule in 1858 it basically says that any owner of land that does not cultivate their land for a period of three to seven years then the state will confiscate it the Ottomans passed that rule in 1858 in order to collect taxes. Like if you have a property, you cultivate it, you make money, you pay taxes. If you don't cultivate it, you make no money, so we'll take your land instead. The state of Israel is not interested in taxes. The state of Israel is interested in, uh, in land and, and more land. So basically what they do was like, we'll apply the exact same, same rule, but when when we confiscate land, we'll not give it to the Ottoman Empire. We'll give it, we'll keep it as land for the state of Israel, even though, once again, it's outside the internationally recognized borders of, of Israel. So what they do, they basically like put so many obstacles between you and being cultivate, cultivating your land. Obstacles like digging a hole in the ground to collect rainwater. Because Palestinian farmers whose land is under Israeli military control, have no access to water infrastructure. But on top of that, if a Palestinian farmer wants to dig a hole in the ground to collect water, like rain water, uh, then the Israeli military will come and destroy it, because you dug that, uh, that hole without our permit, you know? Of course, the same thing with building shelters, the same thing with uh, trying to pave a road network in order to make it easier for your car if you if you are a farmer and had a car, easier to get access to your land. Uh, so there are so many obstacles, and one of the biggest obstacles is, of course, like the Israeli wall. And it happened recently in the, in the town where I where I work. One uh, almost one quarter of that town of Beit Zahur is on the other side of the wall. Like Israel built a wall, uh, basically separating people from from their land in Beit Zahur, and the, they just declared uh, the confiscation of 67 dollars, about like 20 acres of land from that village saying, well, it was not cultivated. And when the, the owners of the land went and said like, well, there has been a wall there since 2005 and you did not allow us to step a foot on our land since 2005. We're like, well, that's a different issue. So it doesn't matter like what, whatever they do you know, to prevent you from cultivating your land. If your land is not cultivated for a period of three to seven years, then the state of Israel will declare it as state land and confiscate it. And I'm talking about in the occupied territories. It's just like maybe when Netherlands becomes stronger than Germany and occupies a part of Germany, they start declaring fields and farms for German farmers as state of property for the state of Israel, for the state of Netherlands, or the state of Israel with this kind of government. But anyway, it makes no sense. I know it makes uh, it makes no sense. So uh, this, which I hope like I managed to clarify pretty easily, this is the the uh, the actual practices on the ground. This is like how everyday Palestinians lose land for the exclusive use of the state of of, of Israel. Uh, and uh, of course, like I should say that because it's an embodiment of a vision that started with the with with, with the start of the uh, Zionist immigration to Palestine where they convinced everyone that it's land without people or people without land you know so the people the land were there but they have been systematically driven out of their land in order to in, in order to, to have like this embodiment of of the Zionist division in, in Palestine. So that's uh, one part of it. That's what's happening on the land. What does happen to olive trees? Like uh, in, uh, in, in the work I do, I uh, basically plant olive trees. Uh, the, <coughs> the importance of, of land is also <coughs> comes from with what that land is planted with, which is 
most of Palestine is planted with, uh, with olive trees. And I'll talk about a little bit about the importance of that tree and come into the, the work we do. Uh, the, the, the olive tree is one of the oldest standing, uh, uh, one of the oldest standing things in Palestine. We have olive trees that have existed for about 4,000 years. Uh, and I don't think there's any structure in Palestine that have been there that lived uh, for this long. Uh, the very first reference to all of the trees in Palestine was in the Old Testament, like when the when the dove came back to Noah on the ark with an olive branch on its feet, saying that it's safe now, the flood is over. Uh, and I think it is from there that we use the olive branch as symbol for peace and prosperity. Uh, also, it's it's a very important tree, and all the religions that exist in Palestine have acknowledged that importance. The olive tree is the holy tree in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and in the Quran. It was mentioned in all these three books for about 80 times. Uh, in, uh, so the religions that exist in Palestine uh, give a holy status to, to the olive tree itself. Uh, of course, the, the olive tree is perfect for the, the environment there, for the weather. We have a very dry weather in Palestine, some of you know, and some of you suffered from it. Uh, so where it's uh, very dry, we have very short winters, and they, like, imagine <coughs> a tree can, like, survive all that, like, a, a precious tree, like the olive tree survives that, so it fits perfectly with the environment in, uh, in Palestine. Uh, the <coughs> the other thing is about like its important uh, impo economic importance. The uh, the olive tree is like let's say um, go back to the the figure is like seventy percent of our uh, arable land, a uh, land planted with trees. Seventy percent of it in the West Bank and Gaza is planted with with olive trees. So it's it's all over the, the landscape. It contributes to nearly 40% of the uh, Palestinian productive economy uh, in terms of the food economy. So, uh, uh, besides like the olives and oil, which every tree produces about like 9 kilograms of olives or 2 liters of oil, it also adds to uh, like an industry we have back home, which is where we, out of olive uh, branches and uh, out of olive wood, we make souvenirs that we sell to pilgrims who come to, to visit Jerusalem and Bethlehem in general. Uh, so it contributes a lot to our economy. The, uh, the other significance that I want to mention is like, uh, it's probably my oldest memory of, of olive trees. Like during the olive, uh, the olive harvest, which is an event that takes place in October, uh, Palestinian families just stop going to school, stop going to work, and go all the family will go in a picnic type of an event where they will be tending their uh, their trees and doing the harvest. And it's a, a, it's a cultural uh, event in which like all families come together, and it's really beautiful because uh, you 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 link the family's history somehow with with the tree, where you find like people telling stories on what happened around that one, what happened like. You know, you just keep, somehow you maintain the family's history and you keep it going around the street. Of course, the olive tree makes it through the, uh, the Palestinian uh, current, uh, let's say, literature. The poetry we have is always there. And uh, Palestine, like, Palestine is, uh, is referred to usually in our modern poetry with, with an olive tree. And also Palestinians, when they <coughs> speak about their expulsion, they refer to their expulsion in 1948 from land, that we were uprooted from, the, from our land. Uh, and this terminology comes from the uprooting of, of olive trees. Um, sadly enough, none of the reasons I, I mentioned are why we plant olive trees in Palestine. None of them. Uh, we started calling for planting olive trees in the year 2001 as a uh, response, a positive response, to the systematic destruction of olive trees carried out by the State of Israel uh, in the West Bank. Since the year 2001 alone, the State of Israel has destroyed nearly half a million olive trees in the West Bank and Gaza. I want to go through uh, 
some of the ways that the state of Israel has used in order to destroy olive trees, one of which is the construction and expansion of Israeli settlements. The state of Israel has more than 130 Israeli settlements, Jewish-only settlements across the occupied territories, and they are built in direct violation of international law. Once again, the Fourth Geneva Convention in Article 49 says the following, like, any occupying power should not transfer its civil population to live permanently in a territory it occupies. That's what the Fourth Geneva Convention, and that's why Palestinians believe it's a violation of international law. And that's exactly what the state of Israel is doing. It moves its civilian population from Israel proper to live uh, permanently in the occupied territories in these settlements. And in order to build settlements uh, you, and expand them, you just expand them on the existence on the existing land, and all of trees have always been part of these lands on which Israel complete, continuously expanding its settlements. The other thing is like, the, these settlements are not in one place, like uh, the state of Israel tries to be like kind of smart in fooling us and say, it's only built on 3% of the West Bank, but that 3% is not in one place, it's all over the, the what is scattered all over the occupied territories. And in order to connect these settlements together and with Israel, you need a network of, of <coughs> roads. Israel has paved nearly 800 kilometers of bypass roads in the occupied territories to connect these settlements with uh, together and with Israel. It does not need a brilliant person to figure out what these like bypass roads are doing. All what you need to do just when you are driving on them, these highways, look on both sides. You'll see farmland on the, on the right, you'll see farmland on the left, and it's uh, an evidence that there was farmland where you are driving. There's 800 kilometers of bypass roads uh, paved uh, uh, throughout the, uh, the occupied West Bank, and something happens, for instance, in Beit Jala, near where, uh, near, like, where I work. Uh, Palestinians have lost land in olive trees, like hundreds and hundreds of olive trees were destroyed in Beit Jala in order for Israel to build a section of the bypass road there. And the awkward thing is that the families that lost the land so that Israel would build that bypass road are not allowed by law, by Israeli law, are not allowed to drive on it, you know? So you lose your land so that Israel will uh, pave a bypass road to prevent you from driving on from uh, driving on it. And that happens on out of the 800 kilometers that happen on nearly 270 kilometers of these bypass roads. So you can think about it in this way, like, yeah, your land will be only for the ex exclusive use of, of us. The other thing is the, the third way, like the infamous Israeli wall that Israel has been building uh, since 2002. This wall is about 730 kilometers long and it's, uh, Israel has been building it since the year 2000 uh, and, uh, and two. One thing to know about this wall is that uh, it does not go on the international recognized borders between the West Bank and, uh, and Israel. These borders, by the way, are 340 kilometers long. The wall itself is 730 kilometers. And it's basically, uh, <coughs> and it's basically that long because it sneaks into the occupied territory, separate, like taking as much land as possible, leaving it on one side, and then leaving Palestinians on usually both sides of the wall. But the biggest Palestinian populated areas are left on one side, and their their uh, property is on on the other. One thing to uh, say about this wall, part of it is concrete, uh, which is like, I, I think the Berlin Wall was three meters high, this wall is between six meters high, and what we have in Bethlehem is 12 meters high, with even a fence on top of it. It's a very interesting wall, that the one we have uh, built on, uh, on Bethlehem land. Uh, but the rest of it is more destructive. The rest of it is a series of barbed wires, uh, the structure about 50 meters wide, uh, with barbed wires on both sides, and ditches, and petrol road, and dirt road, and electric fence. So it's a huge structure, 50 meters wide, 
paving through the Palestinian farmers' land, uh, and it destroys everything on on its way, including uh, including olive trees. I wish we had a beamer to have shown you some interesting photos. But anyways, you can <laughs> yeah, you can imagine imagine how it is. The other uh, way that Israel managed to destroy Palestinian olive trees is through Israeli military operations, and that happens usually in Gaza. Uh, in, uh, like whenever the Israeli military would invade a, pa a Palestinian uh, area, they don't use, they don't send their tanks on the existing uh, network of roads. They go through farmland, and everything on the farmland will not stand in front of their tanks or bulldozers or military carriers. So, uh, one of my very first the very first things I worked, uh, I had to report about was destruction of nearly 2,000 olive trees uh, during uh, an Israeli military operation in an area in Gaza called Wadi Salka. That was one of the very first things, and I kept reporting on uh, on that for years to for years to follow. Uh, also in Gaza, Israel has destroyed olive trees on the uh, unilaterally. Uh, declared buffer zone in Gaza. Like Israel declares an area from 800 to one kilo, 800 meters to one kilometers into Gaza as a buffer zone. It's no man land, uh, and everything like houses, uh, farms, olive trees, whatever existed in that farmland is like completely leveled down now. And any Palestinian who uh, comes into this uh, declared buffer zone will get killed. Like in times of peace, when whenever you don't hear much about Gaza, you will not hear about like how many farmers uh, are shot uh, or injured or threatened for being in this in this buffer zone. And it's about like one quarter of uh, of the size of of Gaza, which is already tiny uh, tiny area. Uh, speaking also about buffer zones, like all the structures I mentioned earlier, like Israeli walls, uh, road, bypass roads, uh, settlements, have military orders declaring an area around them as a buffer zone. So, uh, so the Israeli uh, bypass roads, for instance, any Israeli bypass road has a buffer zone on both sides of the road, 50 meters on each side, <coughs> that's declared as as a buffer zone. Uh, the same thing with Israeli settlements; they have an area of 100 to 300 meters from the fence of the settlement uh, declared as uh, a buffer zone. The Israeli wall has, uh, the Israeli military declares 100 meters to also 300 meters from the Israeli wall uh, as, as also a buffer, a buffer zone. It's not, it should, I should say, that's not implemented everywhere that Palestinians are not allowed on their land within this buffer zone, but Seeing what's happening in Gaza makes, makes me at least feel how it will be implemented or know how it will be implemented in, in the future. 